Okay, 3111. This is where we left off last class. We covered all of the content that you need for chapter 16, but we left a bunch of stones unturned with respect to practice problems. And the first one we wanted to look at uh, this afternoon is 16.13. And if you notice that the diene in every single one of these is identical, right? The diene for every problem is just 1, 3 butadiene. And you see that they put the 1, 3 butadiene in the S cis conformation. Remember, that it can be in an S cis or an S trans conformation, but it's only the S cis conformation that can react. So really, you know, in my opinion, what this question boils down to is practicing drawing your curved arrows and then knowing the rules for stereoselectivity and regioselectivity. So if we just go back here, remember when it comes to stereoselectivity, that deals all the reactions aren't stereoselective, they're stereospecific. So if we start with a trans dienophile, we're going to get a trans substitution in our ring. And if we start with a cis dienophile, we're going to end up with a cis substitution on our ring. And so if we go to the first problem, you can see that we have a trans dienophile, right? We, you see that we have a proton that's going straight down here. And we have another one that's going straight up like this. So this compound is a trans compound. Now, if you're looking at this and you were trying this at home and you said, well, I don't like drawing the curved arrows like this. I don't care for this. What I want to do is I want to redraw the molecules to position that dienophile, you know, more the way that I would like it. And there's nothing wrong with that. So if I just move this over a little bit, if I draw the carbonyl like this and draw this carbonyl like that. So if you have to position it like this, there's no problem with that whatsoever. And I've taught this class for a long time, and I know that some students find this handy. So if we orient the two molecules like this, and then we draw our curved arrows, it doesn't matter if we draw them in a clockwise or a counterclockwise fashion. Now we're gonna draw our product. You can see that we formed one ring. It's a six membered ring. It's a cyclohexene ring, right? Because it's got one double bond. This compound is cyclohexane. When we put a double bond in it, it becomes cyclohexene. So we have cyclohexene. And since we have a trans alkene, what we're gonna end up with is trans substitution for our two acyl groups or, or our acetyl groups is technically what they are. So we're gonna have this compound, but keep in mind that that dienophile, um, it also could have oriented itself like this, okay? So it could have oriented itself like this. And if it did, if we had drawn the curved arrows like that, we would have ended up with this compound where we have um, the, the dash up here and the wedge down here like this. And what are these two compounds? These two compounds are enantiomers of each other, okay? So you don't have to necessarily draw both of the enantiomers. It's totally fine if you don't. What you can just do is delete this and say, well, I'm going to get this compound plus, I'm also going, going to um, get its enantiomer. All right, so that's question C. Give me a thumbs up if you're with me on that one, because if you understood that, a lot of the questions are in a very similar vein. Awesome, and again, if you, if you don't understand and you have a question, just type it in the chat or unmute your mic. I'd be happy to take that up with you. The next one. We don't have any cis or trans to worry about when we have an alkyne. But again, a lot of students don't like the molecules written like that. They said, I want to draw my diene like this and put my dienophile like this. Again, there's no problem with that whatsoever. And so what's going to happen is we're going to draw our diels alder reaction arrows. One, two, three. And now instead of making cyclohexene, we make 1,4-cyclohexadiene. So this is a derivative of, so this again is cyclohexane. If you put a double bond, that's cyclohexene, but now you've got two double bonds. And so this molecule would be 1,4-cyclohexadiene. And we're gonna have our acetyl group coming off of here and an acetyl group coming off of here. Now notice that there's no stereochemistry here. Right, these two carbons that I have highlighted in green, could anybody tell me what the hybridization of those carbons is? And it's not a trick question meant to fool you. Exactly, thanks Tiana, thanks Audrey. A absolutely, everybody's correct, it's sp2. And we know that when a carbon is sp2, right, when a carbon is sp3, 
it's tetrahedral, tetrahedral. And when it's sp2 hybridized, we know that it's trigonal planar, right? And so if that carbon has planar molecular geometry, there's no dash, there's no wedge to be drawn there. You can see I'm running out of space here at an alarming rate. So I'm gonna switch over to a blank document. Just bear with me here. And uh, yeah, let's go over here and we'll do the next one. So this is just moving right along. This is question 16.13 in question um, E that we're working on now. So we draw our 1,3-butadiene and this time our dienophile is this molecule called maleic anhydride. The name isn't important. And yeah, but this is called maleic anhydride. Um, anyhow, so we're gonna draw our arrows. Let's draw them in the reverse direction this time just to make life interesting. So there's our three curved arrows for our diels alder reaction. And this time we're gonna have one double bond in our ring. So it's a cyclohexene derivative. And yes, stereochemistry is going to be important. And I'm gonna draw both of these bonds since, um, you know, since this compound is locked in a cis conformation, I'll draw both of these bonds going down. If you drew both of them as wedges, that's totally fine too. We draw our oxygen in the ring here. And we put this there. Could anybody tell me, am I going to have an, an, an enantiomer to this compound? And this, again, not a trick question. Would this compound have an, an enantiomer? Yes or no? So this one, what do you guys remember about this compound? So this compound will not have an enantiomer. If I take the ruler out, my rich young ruler here, and if I draw a line, Right, we have a plane of symmetry in this molecule. Do you remember what this is called when we have a plane of symmetry? Yes, thanks, Audrey. Yes, it's a meso compound. Yes. So be on the lookout for the for the meso compound. Yes, yes. So it's meso, so it doesn't have an enantiomer. All right. Let's try the last one on this problem. So this is again 16.13F. So we have our same old 13 butadiene that he's really hooked on. This time we have another alkyne, so another alkyne, and we're gonna draw our curved arrows. Just getting some good practice in here. And let's see, we're gonna have another derivative of 1,4-cyclohexadiene. Again, we have cyclohexane, cyclohexene, 1,4-cyclohexadiene. There's no stereocenters in this molecule to worry about, and so that's the only product that we have. I noticed that in my, in my notes, not in your slides, but in my notes, I noticed that I put one more in. Well, we'll just do it for fun. So if you didn't, if you don't have this one scribbled down, we'll give it the old college try here. It's, uh, this compound is called, uh, so this would be 2,3-cyclohexene, um, cyc is what you would call this. Anyhow, it's neither here nor there. But if you tried to draw the curved arrows for this guy, it's gonna look like this, like that. So the carbonyl is not gonna participate in the deals alder. It's always gonna be the double bond. Here, there's no regioselectivity to worry about, even though we discussed it last class because the diene is symmetrical. And so you would end up with this. And of course, the alkene is locked in the cis position. I don't know what I'm doing there. There we go. There we go. And so we're gonna have a bond going down here, bond going down here. That's not very pretty. One, two, three, four. There we go. Oop, that's a lot better. Like that. And we'll just put our carbonyl here. And then, of course, you would also get the enantiomer to this uh, compound as well. All right. Anybody feeling a little more confident after taking a look at those ones? John, ja, good, good. It really takes practice to get confidence in organic chemistry if anybody tells yeah good i like those ones too Jalen. i think if anybody tells you it doesn't take practice to master content in organic chemistry they're full of baloney pardon my language all right let's take a look at we did this one we did 16.16 then we talked about the endo rule right so endo rule is that both of the groups if you have a cis alkene they're both going to be pointing down right they're going to be sin to the larger bridge i told you that my students just remember they're pointing down, and I gave you an explanation as to why we get the endo product. Even though it's more sterically hindered, it's still the major product. But we didn't try any of these um, questions here. 
the first one we have the Dyena file written in the correct orientation, don't we? And notice that when we do it, so look, listen to me very carefully, you guys. Okay, just if you get your pencil, put it down just for a sec. Like, think about it. Everything that we looked at so far today, the Dyena file was one three butadiene. It was just a, a, a chain. Okay, there is no ring in it. Every single diene here is a ring. So if a deals alder always makes a ring, that means we're going to have a ring and a ring. So that means we're going to be making bicyclic compounds in the first three. And in the third one, we got another. So we're going to make a tricyclic compound. So you will have to practice your, your drawing of bicyclic compounds. And so will I. So let's give it a shot here. This first one, we're starting it with cyclopentadiene or cyclopentadiene. There's, it's a symmetrical molecule, so there's no regioselectivity to consider. And it, in fact, if you notice, every single one of these dienes is symmetrical, so there's no regioselectivity yet. That's, that's the subject of the next question. So all we have to do is practice drawing our curved arrows and practice drawing the product. So let's take a look at the first one. We're going to make one sigma bond, break this pi bond, make another sigma bond, take this pi bond and move the electrons over so that we make a new pi bond. So look, we're going to have this one, two, three, four, five membered ring. That's intact. We're not messing that up in any way, but check this out. Now we're also going to have a one, two, three, four, five, six membered ring that we're making. So we've got a five membered ring and a six membered ring in our bicyclo uh, compound. So let's draw the five membered ring first. So one, two, three, four, five. So that's the five-membered ring, right, which has a bridge. Then I'm going to draw these two carbons over here. So this is my five-membered ring. And if you're if you're sitting there at home going, well, hold on, Mr. Dion, is it this a five-membered ring too? You're right. It is. Absolutely. Okay. All right. But this is our six-membered ring. All right. So that's the ring that we made from the Diels alder. And so our pi bond is going to be right here. Now notice that we have a carbonyl in our dienophile. So which way is the is the um, is the uh, aldehyde going to be pointing? It's going to be pointing down like this. So I'm just going to put CHO, which is the um, which is the uh, condensed form of an aldehyde. Now of course the aldehyde could have reacted in that orientation, or it could have reacted in this orientation. Okay, so that would give you the enantiomer. Right, so I end up with a pair of mirror images here because I have a stereo center, right? There's no arguing that this is a stereo center here. And so we get this compound plus we get its enantiomer. All right, let's try the next one, which is in the same vein. The only difference here is that we have a trans dienophile. And so we're going to have one group in the endo position, but one group in the exo position, won't we? All right. So this time I'm not going to twist the dienophile into a ver so that I have the pi bond vertical. Um, anyhow, I'm just going to go ahead and draw the curved arrows. So we have our sigma bond being formed. We have another sigma bond being formed and we have a pi bond that's moving. Maybe I could improve that a little bit like this. OK, so let's try and draw this guy. It's going to look like this. Here's my five membered ring. It's going to have a sulfur in it on the top. So there's my sulfur atom, there's my pi bond, there's my first methoxy, there's my second methoxy group. Put a really big reaction there on it. There we go. All right, then let's round out the six-membered ring, which is going to look something like that. Okay, and I'm going to have one of the carboxyl groups pointing up. So I'll draw one going up like this, and I'll draw the other one going down like this. And then, of course, it's also going to have an enantiomer. All right, not the prettiest bicyclic compound, but I think it gets the, the point across. Everybody with me on that one? Any questions about that one? No? Okay, I have a question, a quick question for you. If you were to draw this compound out in its entirety, are there any pi bonds in here in the nitrile and it's not a trick? Are there any pi bonds in here? In the carbon nitrogen bond. In the nitrile. Yes, there's two pi bonds in there, right? Yes. Okay. And so 
that means that if there's pi bonds in there, the endo rule is going to apply, isn't it? We still have to take the endo rule into account, right? So if you were to redraw this guy, right? Oops, it's not very pretty. Looks like this, right? And then you have a triple bond like this. So you have two pi bonds. And so, yeah, the endo rule is going to be in effect. And so let's try and draw the, the bicyclic compound that we get here. So we'll draw our curved arrows like this, like, oops, that's not very good. Like this, like this, and like this. There we go. So let's see, we'll draw our five membered ring first. All right, looks something. That's not very good. Connect that bond like this. That's a little better. Anyhow, so there's our gem dimethyl. There's our pi bond. And so now we're going to round out our six membered ring, and our nitrile is going to be pointing down, right? We're going to get the endo product. And of course, we can also get an enantiomer for this product. So let's see if you can follow along. There's a lot of information on this slide. All right. This guy. Okay, so there's those three. We'll do this last one here. Uh, again, so let's just switch over back to the blank document just for a, a sec of roo here. If you need to, again, draw the diene and the dienophile. So this is 16.17F. If you need to draw your diene like this and your dienophile, right? This compound, again, was called maleic anhydride. If you need to draw them in that orientation, there's no harm, no foul, oops. No harm, no foul whatsoever. So we draw our curved arrows and now let's draw the product, which is gonna look something like this. And we're gonna have our six member ring that we made during the Gilles Alder. And then the endo rule applies here, doesn't it, right? We're gonna have both of those bonds going down, the bonds for the five membered ring in the maleic anhydride. So if you're doing a problem like this at home and you want to be sure to let everybody know that you're drawing the endo product, what you would want to do is draw the hydrogens that are going up, right? And you can even exaggerate them the way that I have. It's no problem, right? As long as everybody knows, you know, all your friends can see that you are drawing the endo product. Hey, anybody, is, there gonna, is this compound going to have an enantiomer? Yay or nay? And if no, why not? George, what kind of compound is this? George is there, right? Yeah. Heck yeah, it's a meso compound, thanks. Yes, so as he said, it's, it's a meso compound, right? So yes, they're not a meo, I don't know what that is. It's got uh, stereocenters, right? But there's a plane of symmetry through the molecule. It's kind of an interesting plane of symmetry, right? You can't, you can't even really draw it in here. You'd have to kind of be standing over here, you know, looking at the molecule kind of that way or something to see the, the plane of symmetry. All right. Everybody feeling better about drawing the bicyclic and tricyclics now? Because now we're going to, I want to turn our attention to regio selectivity, right? G great, <laughs> great. Okay, because now, um, I mean, really, and I know you guys are all really good at resonance. I know you're very, very good at that kind of stuff. But remember, when, so so far we've covered stereo um, stereo specificity, right? Then we covered bi bicyclics, and now we're getting into regio selectivity. And so you've got to be able to draw resonance forms here, right? If we have something like you know this kind of situation where you have an unsymmetrical diene and an unsymmetrical dienophile. You got to be pretty Johnny on the spot on your um, resonance structure drawing. So we're going to review all of these questions. Where was it? Question 16.7. I want to cover every single one of these. And I actually want to switch over to a blank document to do this whole dang thing because these are important problems. So just bear with me and we'll go over. So this is question 16.1. 16.18. So 16.18, and this is question, well, I guess the first one. Anyhow, so we've got a methoxy group here on this diene. Thinking, yes, I am diene. This class makes me feel like I'm diene. All right, anyhow, so let's see here. 
Uh, what we need to do is we need to figure out on both of these structures, where is the delta plus and where is the delta minus, right? Because those things are going to align with each other because we know there's going to be an electrostatic attraction. And so that requires that we draw some, some pretty serious resonance forms here. So we could start with the diene. I'm just going to copy and paste it over here. So copy and paste just so we can take the time to draw the resonance forms. And you should be able to do it, right? We have an allylic lone pair here. So we could draw a resonance form um, that looks like this, where we put this pair down here, and then we put this pair of electrons down here. So if we do that, we end up with something that looks like this, where we have a carbanion down here, and then we have a positive charge on our oxygen like this okay so that looks pretty good i guess and then with the um aldehyde I'm trying the same actually i should put my square brackets here shouldn't i there we go then for the aldehyde if i ask you guys i would like to ask you a question if i put a um uh, if I put a, a green highlighter on this carbon, could anybody tell me, is that carbon delta plus or delta minus? Based on resonance, if you drew the resonance form already. Would that carbon be delta plus or delta minus? It's going to be delta plus, isn't it, right? Because you've got to, right, you got to think about this. You've got a carbonyl that's got a dipole pulling electrons that way. So, when we draw a resonance form, where was, it, where was I here? Let me delete this. What's it going to look like? Well, we're going to put these electrons here, and then we're going to put a lone pair up there. And so we end up with something that looks like this. Oops. No. So we have a negative charge on the oxygen, but then we have a positive charge down here. And so it turns out that we have the negative the delta minus is down here and the delta plus is down here, right? So we can take our delta plus, say it's down here and take our delta minus and say, well, that's over here. And so there's gonna be an electrostatic attraction between those two. And so they're actually lined up in the way that they would react, right? It's ready to, ready to go. And so now we can draw our curved arrows. I'm gonna draw them in blue and we end up with something, oops. Where am I? There we go. Something that looks like this. So now, what's our product going to look like? So I'm just going to move the structure so I have more room to draw here. So we're going to have a cyclohexene derivative. All right. Um, as far as the stereochemistry of this bond, we don't need to know anything about that. I'm not going to ask you about that. And as far as the endo rule, that doesn't apply here because we're not making a bicyclic compound. And so whether it's a dash or a wedge is unimportant, okay? You get some diastereomers probably here. The idea is that I want you to know that they're aligned in this orientation. So as long as you can draw the product the way that I've shown it here, and yes, Mr. Dion is fully aware that this is a stereocenter, and so is this, but we don't cover that in any detail in our textbook. So if I give you a, a question like this, where you have an unsymmetrical diene or di and dienophile, excuse me, all you're expected to do is to know how they're going to align with each other. All right, let's try another one. If you missed that one, get a chance to redeem yourself on this one. So this is kind of in the same vein. We've got a methoxy group right here. So here's our methoxy, and we're combining that with this guy. See, there we go. Maybe we should draw our triple bond in just so we don't lose sight of that. All right, so could we draw the resonance forms of these? Let's see. We'll start with the, the diene. And I'm sure you could, you know, why don't I ask you again? Like if I put a highlighter here, would that carbon be delta minus or delta plus? Based on the resonance. So that one's going to be delta minus, right? We can't, there's no way to draw a delta plus on that, right? That would be impossible. If you were to try to break this bond and 
put this up here, um, you'd be making a primary carbocation, right? When you have an allylic lone pair right here, right? So if you have an allylic lone pair, so this goes back to chapter two, the patterns of arrow pushing or resonance, right? So we would have something that looks like this, and then we can draw a resonance form where we have a carb anion here, and then we have a positive charge on the oxygen like that. All right, so that would be our best resonance structure. Um, uh, so if you were thinking about taking and you know, drawing something like this, then you've got a resonance contributor where there's um, something is lacking an octet of electrons. And so the one that I have drawn is going to be a more pertinent resonance form. And so we have our delta minus down at the bottom. So we finished that resonance structure. And with the next one, so with the nitrile, right, we could do um, something since we have nitrogen, is, which is the most electronegative element in here, um, we could draw a resonance form like this, where we put the double bond here and then remove a pair of electrons up like this. So we're going to end up with something that looks like this. So we have a double bond here, then we have a carbon, then we have a double bond, negative charge on this nitrogen and a positive charge down here. And so again, they're aligned in the, in the correct orientation in the question. I wouldn't count on that on the quiz or anything or an exam or anything like that, but you can see that the delta um, minus and the delta plus are aligned with each other. And so now we can draw our curved arrows. So again, don't worry about the stereochemistry on these ones because you end up with, well, in this case, you only end up with one chiral center. So yeah, e either way, I wouldn't stress about it a whole lot. So we end up with something that looks like this, where we have our methoxy group here, and then we have our nitrile up here like this. Okay, let's try another one of these that deals with um, regioselectivity. So let's try one more. And this is the last one I had on that slide for 16, 16.18. So we're starting it with our diene. It looks like this. And we've got an ethoxy group here. And then we have an acetylene derivative. It's an ester. I'm just going to draw the whole thing out like this. So I'm drawing the entire structure. And then we want to know, is it going to react in this orientation or a different orientation? So let's start by looking at the resonance form of our diene. And we just did something almost exactly like this a few seconds ago. So we have a lone pair here, and therefore we can donate a pair of electrons like this. So we're going to end up with a resonance form that looks like this, where we have our oxygen, positive charge, and a negative charge here. All right. And then if we draw a resonance form of the other one, of the ester, Right, we know that an ester is an electron withdrawing group, so it's going to pull electrons away like this. And so we're going to end up with, a, with a, what we call a ketene derivative, I guess, or a ketene-like. So we have double bond, carbon, double bond, and we have a negative charge on our oxygen like this. And then, of course, we have our positive charge down here. And so you can see that they are reversed from each other. So we need to turn this guy around. So I'm actually going to redraw the compound. Just bear with me. I'm going to erase this here. And I'm going to move the ester down here. Oops. There we go. So let me move that up. Move it on up. There we go. And there we go. All right. So now we can draw our curved arrows. So we draw one here. Draw one here. And notice that our diene is a, um, a cyclic compound, so we're going to end up with a bicyclic product. So we're going to have our five-membered ring. Draw our five-membered ring. We have a double bond down here. We have our ethoxy group like this. 
Then we draw the two carbons to make our six membered ring. Of course, we only broke one of the pi bonds, so we still have a double bond there. I'm gonna have to move this resonance form out of the way just so I can get the ester group in here. And so remember this carbon is sp2 hybridized, so the molecular geometry is trigonal planar. And so we're gonna put our carbonyl here. And there you have it, my friends. That's it for regio selectivity. So we've covered that one. Is my screen frozen? If it is, I'll hold on, I'll hang up. Just give me a sec. Let's try this. Give me two shakes we'll have to try that. Is that better now? Can you see me moving it back and forth? <laughs> kind of. Okay, good. Thanks for letting me know. If that kind of thing happens, you let me know, okay? All right, so there we go. A little bit of regio selectivity. So we've covered stereo selectivity, regio selectivity, and we've also covered the endo rule. If we go back into the slides, there is another question that I wanted to look at. So, and I always ask this question on my quizzes. Just somewhere down here at the end. So we covered this one, this one, we covered all that. It's this one here, 16.43. So students will sometimes struggle with this problem. And as long as you know how to draw your curved arrows for a deal solver, it should be nothing is easy in organic chemistry. Okay. So Mr. Dion would never ever say that. Like, oh, this is easy. That's not true. Nothing is easy in this class. However, it should be straightforward if you can draw the curved arrows. So do you remember when I showed you last class that if you take a diene and a dienophile, right, the two most basic reactants you could have in a Diels alder, and I said if you heat them up, they do a Diels alder, right, and you get cyclohexene, but you only get a 20% yield. And I said if you do it at a really high temperature, right, your delta G, which is equal to delta H minus T delta S, I said if you crank the temperature up, then your delta G goes from negative to positive. So what that does is it puts the reaction in reverse. Thumbs up if you remember that. Is my screen frozen? No, it's not. Okay. It puts the reaction in reverse. Okay. What, does anybody, could anybody tell me what the name of the reaction is? The one in reverse. What was that reaction called? I like it, Avishi, retro something. You're right. Avishi, you're, you're totally right. It's just retro deals all there is all it is, right? Avishi, and that doesn't mean that it's like wearing bell bottoms or something that is that retro or it's not into neon hats or something. It just means the reaction's going in reverse. That's all it is. So remember that to draw the arrows going from the product to the starting material, the diene and the dienophile, it's the exact same arrows and you can draw them in reverse or you, know, you can draw them clockwise or counterclockwise. It doesn't matter. Look, if I take this, I make a pi bond here. I break this one. I make a pi bond there and I make a pi bond here. Where does that take me? Delete this. It takes me right back from whence I came. Okay. So it's the exact same curved arrows. I'm going to delete this stuff here. The retro deals alder or also known as retro something. All right, I like it. So there we go. So what are we gonna do with this guy? We got a double bond here. Where's my pen, okay? So look, we're gonna make a pi bond here. We're gonna break this sigma bond, make a new pi bond here. Maybe I could make a better arrow. Wink. There we go. And then we're gonna break another sigma bond. So look, we broke two sigma bonds. So we're taking the cyclic compound and we're making two compounds that are acyclic. So what do we end up with? Let's look very carefully. So I'm going to end up with, if I count these carbons, one, two, three, four. I'm going to draw them like this. One, two, three, four. Even number them. One, two, three, four. 
You can see that I made a pi bond between carbons one and two and three and four. They still have a methyl group on them. I didn't even touch that. And if this, these two groups are cis to each other, right? These two carboxyl groups are cis. That means that our dienophile is going to be a cis dienophile. So we draw our double bond and we have our carboxyl group here and our carboxyl group here. And that is it, my friends. That's the whole thing. Those are the reactants, nothing more than that. And if you're like, well, that's okay, but the next one's horrible, you know, look, now I've got a, a bicyclic structure. What do I do then? It's the exact same thing, okay? Don't focus on the ring that bends out of the plane like this. Focus on the ring that has all the substituents on it, right? So the one that's got the double bond and all the substituents, do the reverse arrows. Watch very carefully. We take that pi bond. We make a new pi bond. We break this sigma bond. We make a pi bond. And we break this sigma bond and we make a pi bond. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw the ring, the diene. And if I number my carbons, look, one, two, three, four, five, six. What's it going to look like? It's going to look like this. I'm going to have one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, I'll just number them like this. One, two, three, five, six. And you see that in between carbons one and six and four and five, I formed a double bond. So it's one, three cyclohexa, cyclohexane diene that I end up with. And then what's my dienophile going to look like in this case? Okay, I've got this. Ah, I've got this. Is there any cis and trans to worry about in my dienophile? And remember, I would never try to fool you. It's just a question. Is there any cis and trans to even consider in my dienophile? Yay or nay? Thanks, George. Absolutely. Nothing to consider, right? Why? As, as Tiana says, all our groups are the same. Exactly. And you have one, two, three, four of them. You've got all of these nitrile groups attached. So you can imagine that if a nitrile group is electron withdrawing, which it is, right? You've got a dipole going this way, a dipole going that way. Do you remember last class I said the more electron withdrawing groups you have on the dienophile, the better, the more reactive it is. So you can imagine this thing is reactive, like, like crazy, it's crazy reactive. All right, let's try the next one. So again, focus on the ring that has the substituents and the double bond. So that's this ring here. We're going to draw our retro Diels Alder arrows. So we have one here, one here. And then if you drew yours inside the ring, that's totally fine. I don't like doing that because I always make it look funny. I draw it outside because it gives me a little more room. Okay, so let's draw the six-membered ring. Or sorry, the um, the five-membered ring, which is going to be this. One, two, three, four, five. Like that. Can I draw? Can I draw? One, no. One, two, three, four, five. That's pretty good. All right, anyhow. So we end up with... Cyclopentane diene. That's not very pretty. It's a mix of straight lines and crooked lines. There we go. So there's our diene, all right, that we drew. All right, if you count the carbons, one, two, um, three, four, five, right, it would go like this one, two, three, four, five. And then our dienophile, do we have cis and trans to consider in our dienophile? Could anybody help me out with that? <laughs> Absolutely, yes, thanks everybody, that's fantastic. Yeah, is it cis or is it trans? Right on, right on. Beautiful, there we go. So I end up with an aldehyde here. And here in aldehyde, there in aldehyde, everywhere in aldehyde. Good. Okay, so I've got those done. Let's try the last one. I'll just kind of move some of this junk out of the way. In-house a little bit, right? So really, what's our strategy for this question? Identify the reagents. So really, you could just say, draw 
curved arrows for retro deals alder is all you gotta do. Draw the arrows for the retro deals alder and you are good to go. All right, this one looks a little spicy. Let's see here. Focus on the ring that has the double bond and the substituents. So that's our ring. We're gonna draw our retro arrows. So we're gonna form a pi bond here, break this bond, break this bond. There you go. So what's our dying gonna look like? It's gonna be a five-membered ring. It has an oxygen in it. So there's our diene. And then our dienophile. Could anybody name our dienophile? Even if you're close. Could anybody name it? No. It's malaic and hydride. Okay, it's this guy here. Oops, I'm missing my oxygen. There we go. So this compound here, this is called malaic anhydride. The reason I tell you the name is because it shows up a bunch of times. You can see it's a really good um, dienophile. Why would this be such a great dienophile? Let's think about it. You've got an electron withdrawing group here and an electron withdrawing group there. Okay, you get two strongly electron withdrawing groups on the molecule. So that makes it a really good, um, a really great dienophile. And there you have it, my friends. Those are all the practice problems from uh, all the ones that we had in our slide. That's every last one of them.